So, welcome to our talk. Can I be heard? Yeah, I think so. I hear the echo. Um, so, welcome to our talk about generic control planes and uh, KCP. Um, my name is Stefan Schumanski. I'm working at Upbound on control planes, so on Kubernetes, API machinery, API server stuff. So, hey, I'm MJ. I work at Casti. We we're trying to look into control planes, so too. So before we jump in, a question. How many of you heard about KCP? Right hand. How many of you used KCP? OK, we need to change the second part. <laughs> so this is why we're here. Cool. All right, so we, we, uh, I tweeted uh, recently that uh, this is a deep dive, and we mean it. So don't be afraid. Um, you will learn something either way. So we have basically two topics, generic control plane and KCP, they are highly related. Basically, generic control plane is a foundational work to enable KCP eventually, but you don't need to, to do the second step. You can use generic control plane also on its own. So we start with generic control plane. And um, there was a cap, 4080, um, one and a half years ago. And it was about allowing this, um, yeah, the construction, easy construction of API servers, which are cube-like, and they should inherit certain APIs from Kubernetes, for example, Airbag, permissions, uh, as a role, thing, role binding, similar things, config maps. So they, they are like Kube API server, but without all the compute stuff. So a partial API server, Kube API server, basically. And the cap is still not closed, uh, but um, since 131, so the previous release, we have basically done the heavy lifting. And I guess even if you followed uh, the PR flow in the API server, you might not have noticed that this actually happened. The reason is that um, the heavy lifting has been done, but we didn't do any renaming, any package movement. So there are those um, packages here. If you look into the code, basically the first one is the essential one for, for the work of generic control planes. This is a generic API server, which is able to use APIs from Kubernetes, like config maps, secrets, similar things. The second one, if you read the code, package control plane, um, don't be confused. This sounds like generic control plane. It's not. This is Kube API server. So the renaming, um, the cleanup, all of that will happen. But the heavy lifting has been done, like the split has been done. Um, there's a second part in, in the cap uh, about a staging repository. Hasn't been done either. So um, this is basically the movement. So every, everything you see in the first line there, control plane API server, will likely move into such a, sta a staging repository eventually. It's a work in progress. There are discussions, but uh, yeah, nothing has merged yet. Anyway, the important step is the first one, because this enables basically everything already. And yeah, don't be afraid if you don't uh, know where everything is in the code, we will explain big parts of that. So you're in the right talk if you want to learn how to construct a generic control plane. So cool. So before we go in deeper, switch next gear. So what is control, gen, control planes in general? So most of you use control planes on a daily basis. If you interact with Azure, you act, interact with R, it's an Azure control plane. AWS has the same. So it's a certain API surface which enables you to do, to achieve certain goal for your business, to create something. And it could look like this. Like, simplest one would be just config maps, secrets, service accounts. Very simple one which enables you to do something. Or it could look like something like this, with all the bells and whistles from Kubernetes ecosystem. But the idea is it should be non-opinionated, where you choose and pick what you want to do, because everybody who built an API built uh, some kind of audit capability, logging, service accounts. Like, we did that stuff multiple times, invented this stuff so many times. Like, we should not be doing this stuff. So in general, what it means in this context, it's a new code path in KK repository where you can instantiate a control plane with a specific APIs. You can cherry pick, choose APIs you want to use, and you can get an API. Kubernetes looks like API server, which does what you need to do. In addition to that, to make things simpler, because renames didn't happen yet, we have an additional wrapper builder under KCP Dev Generic Control Plane, which helps you to start it now, helps to connect the dots now, basically, and understand how it is. So before we jump in, before we go into code, bit of API server internals. So 
I personally missed on this one in uh, other presentations out there, so this is why it's kind of here. So everything in Kubernetes is built around this pattern of like three stages, where you have options, you have configs, and you have a server. So when, once you instantiate an options, you tweak something, you take the options object and you instantiate config, you tweak config, you take the config and you instantiate a server. So that's usual pattern in Q. And every component in Kubernetes, most components in Kubernetes uses this pattern. So when it comes to kubeapi server, you have these three blocks. So few full generic control plane server consists of, uh, same as in kube server, consists of aggregator API server, generic control plane server, and API extension server. And all of them, they follow the same pattern. You have options for all of three, you have config for all of them, and at the end, the server, basically, delegation chain. So we will go back to this again, but the idea is usually these ones are your flags, your bind ports, your feature gates. These ones are your clients, informers, authorizers in a code where you tweak some round trippers and things like that, and at the end, you instantiate the server. And basically, also the Kube API server, if you look in uh, Kubernetes 131, is built like that. But this hasn't been the case. So a large chunk of the work in generic control plane in this cap basically was to also take the Kube API server and follow the pattern of options config server, because this enables composition. So you can tweak it. Um, I worked a long time on OpenShift. OpenShift is just possible because of this pattern, because we, we have to tweak a lot in, in, in Red Hat's OpenShift. And um, before 131, it was just not like, like that. Kube API server was always very messy and um, yeah, was years behind things like the API extension API server, which is serving CRDs, for example. So it's about that tweaking, opportunities to tweak and comp compose components. Cool. So code, show me the code. This is how the generic control plane would look like. Like, don't get scary. Like, we'll get a bit explain it. So this is part taken from generic control plane repository. So what this is on the screen is this, basically, where we take a, uh, we construct this, all the chain of delegation in a taken API code. So we take an extension server, which serves your CRDs. We take generic control plane server, the one which got split out. We instantiate it. We take aggregator server, and we use that. And before that, there is a filters, chains, authorization, authentication, basically, in front of that. So this is how it looks like to map it back to that picture. So you have on top not found the handler. You have an extension server, basically, which serves your CRDs. You have Kube API, config map secrets are back. And you have uh, aggregator API services, open API, things like that. So you construct this chain. If you notice, you pass control plane, gets passed back in into the next one chain. So it's kind of, it builds like this. So you build this delegation chain. It's a first in, last out. So you instantiate the not found handler first. It gets called last. So all in all, this chaining of the code gives you a generic control plane server. So we had this idea of like, okay, how to make it more pluggable? Let's look to the code in cube and see what it would take to make it uh, switchable. So we use the same pattern we use in KCP batteries, and we started looking how we can identify. Like, example, if you want API services, it's a cube aggregator component. If you want CRDs, that's API extension server. And we kind of played with this. It's still very much prototype. Some things are broken, not yet, but you can already feel the, how it is. So what you get, you get pluggable do it yourself, Kubernetes-like API server out of the box. So first demo, we have two of them. And uh, I was told to use this fancy fake shell stuff, but let's not do that. So what they do in this case, I start GCP start from the generic control plane repository. And it's ready. You saw how fast was this. Basically, it's faster than any mini cubes or mini shifts out there. So if we explore this instance now, like Kube API resources, this API is available, gives you this. You have very small API surface. So if you're building a SaaS or something or some internal configuration management system, it's enough to achieve most of your goals. If you try to build, get CRDs, 
It says like, no, there's not such a thing. You try and install it. It says like, yeah, no, go away. Or namespaces works like that. This means it, it's, in this case, API extension server, which serves as this is not even included in a chain. We kind of skipped it altogether. Another example would be full flow. So in this case, start and list of batteries. Saying like, I want everything. So start it again. Five, so if we do the same thing, exploration, now we see full blown API server. So this means it enables you to take an opinion, choose what you want to have from the binary and just create your own. And in this case, already exists because I didn't clean it before demo. So if you get CRDs, you can see it's there. So you can add CRDs and basically do what you want. So that's a sim simple way how you can use a generic control plane and compose, compose your own, basically, APIs. All right, so we have seen one generic control plane, and obviously the next step is if you can have one, maybe we can have many. And those of you who have looked into KCP, KCP is about that, right? Many control planes. And um, basically, it's this whole block we have seen before, the chain, there's a delegation uh, chain. Um, we now, yeah, we, we just draw it as a small generic control plane box here. And uh, we have one, that's what we have seen. KCP is about many, many in one binary. So we don't run many of the GCPs, but KCP is just one binary in the simplest case. But it can host many control plans, like 100 or 1,000 or something like that. So that's the simplest case for KCP. So you can basically check out KCP as a repository, say KCP start, and you get that. I mean, in the beginning, there's just one generic control plane, um, but you can create many if you, if you like to. And very important, there's just one etcd. So everything is hosted in this one binary, but you still have many control plans, and you can use them for multi-tenancy, for example. All of them are isolated. All of them have their own CRDs, for example, completely independent. Um, in KCP, we don't call them generic control planes. It's a long word, so um, we call them clusters. I mean, everything here, every of those control planes, you can point your kube uh, cutter against or any other kube client. There's a special URL of the server, and you just talk to one of those control planes. And it looks like a cluster. I mean, there are no pods, but still, it's a cluster with garbage collection and, and quota and similar things. But of course, they are logical. I mean, it's, it's similar like virtual machines, right? VMs are not machines, they are virtual, and here they are logical clusters. Similar thing, um, we have many logical clusters in the system. And all of them store the data in, in one etcd. And every of those control plans, they basically get their slice in etcd. So we slice etcd, and we have a prefix for every control plane, and that's where the data, like the config maps and secrets and everything else, is stored for one control plane. But they don't interact, in the beginning at least. And um, yeah, more control planes, we can even start multiple instances of that. etcd, of course, is limited. Um, there's a certain size you can maximally have. So um, if you want to horizontally scale and you want to use that for a backend for a, a, like some kind of um, cloud service, you need much more than one etcd, right, obviously. So what we can do, we can start another one. So you could run many KCPs. This is fine as long as you don't want cross-logic cluster logic. KCP brings some of that, we will see in a second. So this is actually not what you want. So KCP has a mode um, which can have arbitrary many shards. So we have sharding in KCP. Every shard is an instance which has its own storage backend, which is normally etcd, but can also be something like kind-based or so, in theory. But the whole control plane acts as one control plane. So basically, you have um, yeah, here, a URL path slash clusters and then some logical cluster name. The so logical cluster name normally is just some cryptic random, I don't know, 12-character um, string or something like that. We see that uh, in some examples later. But basically, there is one endpoint you can talk to, and if you use the right path, you get the right logical cluster. And the redirection, we, we go into that uh, into details later, um, this is automatic, basically. So you, you reach the right chart where the logical cluster is stored. This is all nice. Um, we have many uh, logical clusters, but we want certain logic which makes logical clusters to interact. So we want to fill this void with certain primitives, um, which Kubernetes doesn't need, but here they, they make a lot of sense. 
there, there are two, two major ones. One are workspaces, and we show them later on. They are optional. You don't have to use them. So you can use KCP just with logical clusters. It's all fine. But workspaces are very convenient, and we show uh, it in a second how this works. And there's a second bucket. It's about APIs. So we su support CRDs, but we also have a concept of API exports, API bindings, more powerful. It's multi-logical clusters, so you can basically um, export something from one, one cluster and bind from uh, other cl clusters to that API. This is not the topic of today. There are some talks on YouTube. You can um, Google for them. Um, we will more focus on the workspace part and some other components of Kubernetes today. All right, so um, workspaces. And the inspiration of workspaces um, more or less comes from yeah, file systems. Um, everybody will know uh, Linux file systems. You can use your shell and you can walk around some hierarchy of directories, right? And um, behind the scenes, the Linux kernel has the concept of an inode. An inode is something, it's a data structure which is stored uh, in, the, in the hard disk or uh, SSD or something. And it tells, the, cluster, uh, it tells the, the kernel that there is real data, right? It can be a directory, it can be a file, and the inode has metadata basically to describe what the actual data is which is stored behind it. And the same idea we have in KCP. Basically, we have a logical cluster object. So it's a kind logical cluster. And in the moment you put that at the right slice of etcd with the right prefix, this slice exists as a logical cluster logically for KCP. So it will start things like garbage collection and quota. In the moment, this logical cluster object exists. So it's very similar to an inode, right? It gives um, the kernel, the KCP kernel, this information. Here is something which is a cluster. Okay, so um, that's a cluster, that's an inode. And the second concept is a workspace. So you can put workspaces into such a logical cluster and with that, you basically connect uh, yeah, those logical clusters. So you say, for example, so we started root, there's one logical cluster called root, and we put a workspace A object into that, and it's very similar to a directory entry, entry basically, and this one uh, points to another virtual, uh, logical cluster here. So basically, we have now a hierarchy of, of workspaces. So it's root, and we use a colon um, to um, separate those components. So root colon A is another logical cluster. And you can nest them. You can have root colon A colon C. So basically, we replicate what Linux or any, any other operating system, modern operating system does with, with file systems. And um, what you also see here on the left, you have a path which you can use to access a logical cluster. So you can use this logical thing called root colon A colon C in your kube uh, cuttle, in your kube config, and talk to that. But you can also use the logical cluster name. It's the same thing. The system knows both um, identifiers, basically, to access it. And every logical cluster, again, this comes back now to the general control plane, can have objects like config maps, cluster roles. But they only act by default in one of those cluster um, buckets or in those boxes. All right, um, how does it look like? I mean, this is not really KCP core, but it's, it's a convenient extension. There's a, a plugin for kubectl, WS, and here's a, a hierarchy we have seen. There are some more uh, workspaces which we use for a demo later. And you can look at the logical cluster object. It's always called cluster, so it's always the same name, but um, the, the prefix in etcd is different. And you can go into A, and you can, again, look on this object. It always exists. And um, yeah, basically, yeah, you see the reference, what, uh, how they are connected. All right. So wait a minute. If we took this from the Linux file system, one thing which I really like in Linux is ability to mount things, like FuseFS, NFS, like basically create these links. Like, does, how does, does this work in KCP in any way? Yeah. It, it works. We have a prototype for that, and it looks pretty, pretty nice. So the idea is, um, what can you mount? I mean, um, you can mount clusters, right? You can mount other workspaces, but maybe also Kubernetes clusters. So imagine you have this hierarchy, and people work in that, and then they can mount in their Kubernetes cluster. And when they use this shell-like kubectl ws, like a CD in, in the shell, basically, and move around the hierarchy, they can enter a kube cluster, and they can say kubectl ws dot dot to leave it again, to be in the hierarchy in the parent again. So kube clusters are a thing. 
But what about V clusters? You could maybe mount V clusters. You could build a V cluster service. So imagine um, there's a command, kubectl create V cluster. You call it B. And then you just say basically WSB, like you enter it. Uh, it's part of the hierarchy. When you delete it again, it's gone, right? But in the moment you enter it, you can deploy components. You can deploy um, any cube uh, workloads because it's a cluster. And it doesn't matter for kubectl what it is. It's in the hierarchy, but it's actually it's a, a real Kubernetes cluster or a virtual one in this case. Yeah, how does this work? Um, I mentioned before there is a redirection from this slash cluster URL with either an ID or a path to the right chart, right? And what we did, we basically added support for mounts. So um, it doesn't have to be a shard which serves the data of a workspace. It can be something else. It can be a, a proxy which serves or redirects basically requests into a cube cluster or into a V cluster or anything else. There can be many, many use cases for that. And that's how it looks like. So we have a workspace object in, 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 in KCP, and we have that for quite some time. And as an experiment, we added um, a type. So the old um, only type was logical cluster, but now we add a mount. And if you choose the mount type, you can specify another resource, a V cluster resource. And the V cluster resource is served by a controller. So this is an extension point, basically, for any kind of mounts. It's not hard coded. KCP doesn't know anything about V clusters. It just knows about mounts, like the Linux kernel knows about mounts. And um, you, yeah, in, in Linux, you have Fuse as a um, user mode mounting mechanism. And this is basically very similar. You have a controller which um, publishes a URL where this V cluster actually lives. And the front proxy this is a proxy component in front of KCP, which is deployed anyway. Um, and every installation of KCP is forwards then to this URL. Cool. So we have 30 minutes left. So let's speed up a bit if it was not fast enough already. So how does it look like in experience way? So same structure we had before, just in this case, B is a mounted cluster. So if I go CD into that, I check API resources. Now I'm in the cluster, in a remote cluster. So experience, it's as seamless. It's just CD somewhere and you get out. If I, you go back and in this case, you get cube cluster. Cube cluster is where V cluster was in a previous example. It's basically CLD implementing them out. It's like a fuse for the, for the implementation. And if you try to get a workspace object, for now it's in annotations, an experimental annotation where you specify kind. And after that, KCP will handle all the machinery and mount things where it needs to mount. And just thought experiment, what if you can just do kubectl create v cluster, create cluster, and it will handle everything for you. So we're just going to leave this hanging here. So recap, we basically created this extension point to the existing system, basically, where you can hook up your existing compute infrastructure into KCP and start playing with APIs. So now we're gonna jump a bit into the deep dive of the specific components. And one of the first ones we're gonna do is a front proxy. So front proxy, for those who tinkered with Nginx control, an example in Kubernetes, they know that if you go into the pod, the pod knows every, the Nginx controller knows every pod which needs to send traffic. It, needs a, it, it knows the API address, it knows where the pod is, so it can route the traffic there. So if the pod moves the nodes, Nginx controller gets updated information. So front proxy in KCP is this something similar for, for basically KCP. So what it has, it has this indexes graphs of every shard workspace uh, logical cluster or mounts available in the system. So when the request hits with a request path, which I already covered, like clusters logical name or something, it goes through this index as like, okay, where this workspace sits. This workspace sits in KCP EU2 and it forwards the request where it needs to go. And if it's a mount point mounted somewhere, it can send it somewhere else. So it's very simple, simply elegantly implemented. It basically does the same, same thing what Nginx does in your kube cluster, but for, for basically KCP. Yeah, another component is, uh, yeah, it's a cache server, we call that. So there's a cache involved, and it sits in the middle of shards. 
Um, there can be many of them. Doesn't matter. Here we, we have drawn one. Um, if those shards share information, or they, they have APIs which somehow interact between two different shards. So I mentioned exports and bindings, right? So you could export from one shard and bind from another. Then the binding shard has to know about the export, right? But it doesn't know it usually because it cannot access the other shard. It doesn't even know about it, maybe. So the cache server is basically this intermediate thing where the exporting shard exports or publishes basically this object. Here is an API export. The world should know about it. And the binding sees that, and the binding controller can basically con consume this API export. And this caching server um, yeah, basically has a, has a complete picture about those objects which are important for cross-shard um, logic. So it's eventually consistent. It's publishing, right? So eventually the state will change, and it will be published and seen by another shard. And um, yeah, it's eventually consistent. The, it has limited size. So what we have implemented today, this, um, this caching server is based on etcd. But it doesn't really have to be. One could imagine some distributed database behind. It doesn't really matter. Um, we make use of the Informa interface. So we use watches and this, the normal infrastructure from Kubernetes, to ask the cache server whether it knows about an object. So we, yeah, it's convenient, basically, to make it an API server itself. But technically, it doesn't have to be. And um, they're not only exports. When you want to bind to an API, you have to authorize yourself, right? So, for example, certain airbag objects, like roles, whole bindings, are important to authorize. And the binding shard should do the authorization, not the other one. So we also export or publish some of the airbag objects, for example, but super sparsely. So we, we basically take the subset of objects, airbag objects, to allow authorization. And there can be more, like admission, for example, admission webhook definitions, so these kind of things. So it's eventually consistent. What does it mean, eventually consistent? Yeah, we can go one step further with this architecture. The binding shard does not talk to the exporting shard. So this means if the exporting shard goes down, I don't care, right? The binding shard can do its work as long as the cache server has the data it needs. And what you can do, we can basically deploy KCP um, in different regions without um, breaking the resilience of the system. So we could have one, um, yeah, one region in the US, for example, have a couple of front boxes, a couple of shards, and another one in Europe, in Germany, in Frankfurt or so, um, same thing. And um, there will be two cache servers, and they replicate this global state, eventually consistent. And if there's a network split because US West 1 goes down or something, or network doesn't work, the European side can still work, and um, conversely. So this is not an anti-pattern to deploy KCP globally. So it's different than Kubernetes. It's really built for this use case. Cool. So one of the last things we covered now is a bit, how do you program against it? How do you interact with these things? So most of you know controller runtime. It's a well-known fra framework pattern to write controllers. And nothing different. We have a, our own branch, our own fork for that, because it's a cluster aware. But so what you do, you instantiate cluster aware manager, you point to the global KCP endpoint, and the only difference is that in the request where you usually get name and namespace identifying the object, you get additional field cluster name, which is a logical cluster name. You set it as a context of a helper, and you pass it to the dynamic client. And everything else will be sorted under the hood by the machinery, means if you already have a control, controller operator written with controller runtime, it's very easy to convert it to cluster aware pattern, basically. And but of course, you can always run any controller against a single logical cluster. It's cube. It's compatible. This is really just for the case you want one controller for all logic clusters on a shard. Cool. Yeah, so this was one shard. Um, what about multiple shards? Uh, the solution is simple. First of all, you might need the cache server, right? I showed the cache server as a component. Many APIs, many controllers don't need that. So for most of them, this is just not needed. But in case you need that, like the API binding controller in KCP itself, this has to know about the exports. And what it does, it has another cache, basically a cache in the sense of controller runtime. So it's a cache object. So it talks to another endpoint, the cache server. So, and um, behind the cache are informers, cube informers, nothing special. And they know about those globally known objects, like in this case, the exports. So imagine this is the export or the binding controller. 
then the binding controller will first check the local manager. Do you know this export which the binding points to? And if the export is local on the same chart, then this just succeeds, right? And uh, everything proceeds. But if it's not, not found error, then um, you have a second chance. You look into the cache server informers, check whether there is an export. And if, if it is, you proceed. If it's not, then it's just not known. And you have to set some condition or so in, a, in, a, in an API binding. That's a pattern. So it's not super complex, but it allows basically multi-sharded multi -sharded controls. If you have multiple shards, it's typical, and this is a restriction of our controller runtime variant at the moment, that you run one manager per shard. And the manager handles all logical clusters, but you have multiple of them. And there are URLs you have to talk to. In the example of the export, you get those in a list. And you have two queues, two managers, and um, they do the work. In the moment there's a new shard coming up, you start a new one. But this is a restriction of, um, of controller runtime. So what's important here is, if you're now writing a controller runtime operator and you want to talk to five clusters, because you don't want to run five instances of controller runtime, you have the same problem. So there is an upstream effort controller runtime to make it generic. So controller runtime knows how to talk to multiple clusters. So we're resuming this work now and basically this. This is not a new problem basically here. Cool, second three minutes to go and second demo. Let's see how it goes now. So let me cancel existing demo first. So I'm starting here a KCP instance. It's a vanilla KCP instance, which is now failing. This is why you prepare a recording for this stuff. <laughs> if we would have more time, I would try to fix it, but now no. <clears throat> So what we have here is like, on the bottom, I have a kind cluster, simple kind cluster, nothing more, nothing else. And I have a workspace kind cluster. That, that workspace is a mounted, it's a mount. So let's check the whole global structure of all three. So let's go to this consumer workspace, check again, workspace as kind cluster, use it. And if we check what's inside, it's the same cluster as in the bottom. I'm just interacting it through the KCP, through the mount point. And we can see there is a, as shown in the pictures before, it's a representation of mount point, a cube cluster. But what if we can do something more? So I'm in a top window, I'm creating a V cluster object. So it's a sub different implementation. Let's say cube cluster is NFS. I'm creating B cluster, which is fuse, basically. So what happens now in the bottom, you would see that once I created that object, the B cluster is being provisioned in a kind cluster. The important note is there is no operator running in a cluster which manages B clusters. It's an operatorless cluster. So basically what we have, we have Operator runs pointing to the KCP and goes and provisions components into the multiple, potential multiple clusters. So in this case, once it gets provisioned, I created like workspace here. You go into the workspace, you can get logical cluster. Logical cluster is there because at this point it acts as a normal workspace. So what we need to do, we need to like not uh, I think at that point I was thinking I'm being smart leaving comments in the demo recording, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's a it's a not a cluster. It acts as an empty directory in Linux file system which you want to mount something on top. So now we mounting. So we annotating that workspace telling you, hey, workspace, this is a B cluster object which mounts it. So now if I go into the same Teams one workspace. I see now it's a basically a V cluster inside of our cluster. So it shows that you can mix and match different ways of mounting components, like one kind cluster mounts whole cluster, another not only mounts, but goes and provisions something and mounts it too. So you can create this as a service itself. And you can create the namespaces, like do whatever you want to do as you would do in a normal cluster. Cool, and if you delete those, basically that gets deleted. 
So thinking ahead, one could create a system where the developers could request B clusters dynamically from the existing pool of compute and things like that. So live demo failed, as some expected sometimes. Yeah, very, very quickly. So this is one way to add compute back into uh, KCP. There was something called TMC, Transparent Multicluster. Don't confuse that. If you watch old YouTube recordings, there might be TMC, and it's often shown as part of KCP. We moved it out, uh, moved it into its own repository in the KCP dev org. TMC is not part of that. Those are diff different ways to re-add compute, different services on top. So compute in KCP is always something on top. It's never in the core. KCP core does not compute. Like, it's always about APIs. It's a framework to build something, some service. If you want compute, choose either mounts, continue TMC, build your own thing. Doesn't matter. And of course, there can be more things in vCluster Cube, Garden as one example. Namespace as a service could be built, obviously. Many, many things. All right. Thank you. Cool. Just a, a shout out, there are two more talks. Um, James uh, for, from, from Apple uh, shows work which is related and inspired. And the last thing is, uh, yeah, Nvidia. on Friday, NVIDIA is showing integration with Slurm, so AI area, also KCP and Q-based, um, yeah. So I don't think we have a time for questions. So if you want to talk with us, just after this, we will be at the Project Pavilion Kiosk 2A. So we'll be hanging out there until evening. So if you bring soft drinks, hard drinks, bring one for us too, and let's have a chat. And you can find us on Twitter, GitHub, 